comrades, uh, we are about to start in about uh, two to three minutes. I would just make uh, a request to comrades who are outside to start coming inside because we are about to start. We're actually an hour late and we apologize for that. So we are about to start and would, would like a song from comrades here just to create that, you know, electric uh, environment there. We are comrades. We can't be here like we are capitalists. Yeah? We are socialists. Uh, thank you very much. Asi funi agenda ya ma capital sasiku ah Asi funi agenda ya ma capital sasiku ya bula lo krisan agenda ya ma capital ya bula lo mampu Agenda ya ma capital. Ya 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 agenda ya ma capital. Yo a bula lo mampush. Agenda ya ma capital. Iyo ya bula lo krisan, iya agenda ya ma capital, 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 iyo ya bula lo stiffy. Agenda ya ma capital, iyo ya bula lo sobu. Iyo agenda ya ma capital, iyo agenda ya ma capital, iyo agenda ya ma capital, iyo agenda ya ma capital. Oh, ya, bula lo mampush. Agenda ya ma capital. Iyo ya, bula lo krisan. Iyo agenda ya ma capital. 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 Iya agenda ya ma capital, oh ya bula lo pico. Oh ya bula lo sobu. Iya agenda ya ma capital, iya agenda ya ma capital. The agenda ya ma capital, the agenda ya ma capital, oh ya bula lo mampush, oh ya bula lo krisan, the agenda ya ma capital, chio chio, chio mama chio. Chiyo, chiyo, chiyo mama, chiyo. Kuta, kuta, kuska vaska utunya. Kuta, kuta, kuta vaska utunya. Aungkosi, aungkosi sigelela. Au sigelela, au i Afrika. Au malupa ganyisu. Lupa ganyi 
Yesu au pondo layo au izwa imitandazo au imitanda zo yetu au sibe moya monye sibe moya mo au noma noma segunzima au segunzima au emtlaveni Sitogunyezwa Sitogunyezwa Aungabuthugu Aungosisipe mandla Aungosisipe mandla Ugunguba Aungosilwe no satane Silwe no sata Au noma, noma segunzima Au segunzima Au emtlaveni Au situgunyezwa Situgunyezwa Au ngama ufu Au nkosi sipa manza Au sipa manza Au ugunoba Au silwe no satane Silwe no satane Amanda Forward to socialism, forward Down with capitalism, down Amanda, uh, comrade, uh, we are about to start. I'm going to ask uh, comrade Peter Alexander to give us a welcoming address, uh, just a small address. Comrade Peter, over you. Uh, thank you very much, comrade Pussel. Um, on behalf of the Centre for Social Change and the organising committee of this event, I would like to welcome you all very, very warmly indeed to the University of Johannesburg, and particularly this campus. Amanda! Pansy capitalism, Pansy! Viva socialism, viva! We know that there are still many comrades arriving. It's a long way to chair from Rustenburg and from uh, Maracana. And if you've been working underground this morning, it's quite difficult to get here on time. So I'm sure you'll appreciate that there'll be more people arriving, and I hope that you will pass on our welcomes when you meet with them. The idea behind the event was firstly that we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx, the greatest revolutionary thinker there ever was. But we want to do this in a way in which we understand his ideas as being relevant to the moment today in South Africa and to our struggles. And one of the key things for us is that there has to be unity. Unity between workers, unity between workers and students, between workers and students, and people in community organizations. So today, there will be people from many different communities, I know from various parts of Soweto, from Tembilikli, is Tembilikli here yet? Okay, there will be many of them arriving, I'm sure. From Sakani, I saw Sakani, Sakani here? Yes, and from Balfour, uh, from Freedom Park, from, round of applause to the comrades from Freedom Park who are leading the struggle on housing. Um, Kwatema, Potchefstroom, I saw some Potchefstroom comrades. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here in numbers as always, good, good to see you comrades. Um, from Diplo, from Orlando, people arriving just recently, hey, a big number. Okay, so people are arriving. It's good to have all of you here. Uh, so the other point about today's event is not just unity and bringing people together from different backgrounds, but also to have a political discussion. So the speakers on this list have got different arguments to make. It's a political discussion between people who will be up here, but also it's an engagement, it's an open debate between all of us here. So this isn't one of those rallies where you just listen to speakers and people all in one line and have nothing to say. The whole idea about this activity today is that we're talking to each other, all talking to each other. And if you look on the program, and if you haven't got a program, perhaps you can put your hand up and Nicole over there will bring you a program. But if, you haven't, if you've got a program, 
you'll see that the idea is that the chairs have all been asked to limit the speakers to only 12 minutes. So 12 minutes, 12 minutes. And then there's an opportunity for everybody to discuss and debate for about two minutes each. And if you don't want to speak in English, no problem. Speak in any language you want to use. And we'll find ways of translating so that everybody who is present here today can participate in the discussion. And we hope in the process of that, we'll clarify, we'll clarify the kind of ideas that are necessary to take us forward in a successful struggle to smash capitalism and establish a social society. So without further ado, let me pass you over to our chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Peter. Uh, we have already wasted uh, more than an hour, so I think we'll start right away. Uh, our session is entitled, what, what is Marxism? And I think it, it lays the foundation to what will happen throughout the day. So without any wa wasting any further time, I'd like to introduce my, my speakers. Uh, on my right, it's Comrade Claire Siruti. Comrade Claire Siruti is an activist who is affiliated with Keep Left. And uh, on my left, I have uh, Comrade Tabang Bili, who is a student at the University of Cape Town, is part of the uh, left student forum over there, and is also affiliated to the Workers' Party. Can you please give both of them a round of applause? Uh, comrade Peter has uh, laid down the, uh, the, the ground rules and the rules of engagement. So I think without wasting any more time, I'll give over to uh, Comrade Tabang, who will be our first speaker. Comrade, over to you. Amanda. 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 Forward to socialism forward. forward. Down with capitalism down. down. Down with capitalism down. Down, down with Cyril Ramaphosa down. down. Thank you very much, comrades. Uh, comrades, firstly, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this event uh, for providing us with uh, an opportunity to be able to engage and to share ideas amongst each other on the, the topics of Marxism. Um, but last night I was thinking on how I should be able to approach this topic and I was just asking myself a very fun question to say that if I were to be asked to uh, explain Marxism in two sentences, what would I say? And I came up with something like this, that uh, first and foremost, Marxism is about the lived experiences of the working class. It is about also understanding how social change comes about through the lenses of class analysis. It is also about, you know, it also provides us with some kind of an ideological and a theoretical guidance that is drawn from the political practice and the struggles of the working class to enable to equip us in order for us to move from the society that we find ourselves in into a different kind of society. Um, it is, uh, Marxism, it is mainly about um, trying to understand the process of world creation. So Marxism asks very simple but fundamental questions. Questions such as who creates the wealth in society? Who will own and control the wealth that is produced in society? How can, uh, what are the locomotive forces that can enable us to move from one social system to the other? Who are the social agents that are able to transition us from one society to the other? And I think Marxism correctly argues that uh, in society or in the world, we live in a world where it's divided into two. Those who must work in order to, in a wage, in order to survive and meet their uh, daily needs, even if it's at the bare minimum, and those who appropriate the labor of others to enrich themselves. Um, and this observation, comrades, it is not based on some kind of moralism, important as it is, but it is based on the objective uh, reality of exploitation of labor and uh, nature in order to create some kind of commodities that can be sold in order to extract the labor power from the working class in order to create what they will call surplus value and all that. Um, this simply just means that if you are a worker in a factory or whatever, then you work from nine till five, 
then from about 9 till maybe 11 or 10, uh, you already met the wage rate that the, the employer is paying you. Then maybe from 10 up until 5, all those hours go to the bosses. But Marxism also understands that this relationship is not just confined to the point of production in the factories and all that. But this relationship also extends in our communities, it extends in our homes, it extends in our relationships, it extends in our children, what they will call at the point of reproduction. So this also brings me to something that I also want to say. It brings the, also the element of race and uh, gender in terms of understanding capital in the context of South Africa. I think we must not run away from the fact that in the South African situation, we know that capitalism uses uh, black people, here I'm using the bigger black definition, uh, as uh, subsidies for cheap labor, but it also uses this gender construct that has been created in society in order to confine uh, women, even though even in the home where a man and a woman works, or even though it is a family that is organized on, on gender non-binaries, that there will be those who would be responsible for the physical and also the psychological maintenance of mainly men, even though both of them are working, that even today we know that it still remains the responsibility of women to cook, to do all of these things, to socialize children in some kind of a class so that they can become potential uh, workers. Um, also to introduce them to some kind of cardinal uh, values that are much more palat palatable to, to capitalism. So comrades, Marxism um, recognized that uh, there's a relationship that exists between those who work and those who steal and lynch of the labor of others, the capitalists. Um, it's not a relationship that can just be resolved through a bargaining table or through a handshake. This relationship, uh, it is irreconcilable. And uh, this means that the uh, uh, workers will always demand more from the bosses because they need to survive. Uh, because we know in this current situation that the buffalo is increasing vet, things are going up and all of those kinds of things. This necessitates that wages have to go up. But we know that it is also not within the class interest of the bosses uh, to concede on those demands precisely because um, they abide by this thing of economic growth, ban, 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 but what it simply means is that enriching uh, the bosses at the expense of the worker. So Marxism understands uh, these relationships uh, very well, and Marxism also argues that for us to be able to uh, get rid of this exploitation that exists between a worker uh, and capital, is that this relationship, we can't just wish it away, we can't just pray and hope that tomorrow things will be okay. Workers, the working class, must organize themselves into a power. Um, but this some organization is not organization for just the sake of organizing ourselves. It must be an organization that is organized on socialist basis. So that brings in the question of ideology and theory. But also we're not just a, a, a talk show or talk shop, whatever they call it. Um, this power that is organized it must now advance into some kind of struggle to be able to seize political and economic power so that the working class can be able to own and control what they produce in society. So, uh, comrades, uh, Karl Marx also argues that for us to be able to have this imagined uh, socialism from below, that there has to be the self-emancipation of the working class. And... Uh, here I would like to pose some of the challenges that I think are confronting uh, Marxism today, particularly in the context of South Africa, and how we can be able to organize our struggles correctly to qualitatively change society. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about is the question on how does Marxism, for an example, answers the question of identity. Um, we know that as I'm speaking today in the Western Cape, that clashes between a community of like many black African working class community called Sitalo and the Mitchell's Plain. There's so many racial tensions that exist in that uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, confrontation. I learned that one person uh, was reported to have died actually by, by last night. So comrades, I think uh, also in our own class analysis, we should be able to take into account the question of identity. In most of the political schools that I attend, you'd hear comrades saying, uh, race is there to, uh, was 
you know, instituted to divide and conquer. Yes, that is true. Some would say he was there to divide and define, to, you know, all these kinds of uh, fancy things. Um, but it's also a lived experiences, and we can't just wish it away if we want to unite the whole of the working class. So we have to come up with concrete strategies, and I wish we'll be, we're going to be able to share some of those things to be able for us to confront and challenge uh, these realities. Um, the second one is that the, how does, for an example, Marxism answer to the question of the environment, the question of uh, ecology and all that? It is my argument that to just say that the working class should just own and control the means of production then everything to the environment is going to be okay. No, this is not the case. We're going to have socialism but with no planet to implement it on. I think the, way, the means in which after we've seized uh, um, this economic and political power, we need to come up with new ways on how we're going to be able to produce to meet the daily needs of everyone that lives in society. Because, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just expand on that during the question and session. Um, also, how are we going to deal with the changing nature of production today? Some people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Some will say it's the sixth, the seventh, the ninth, the tenth, whatever. But in reality is that we know that production is changing. Uh, most of the arguments that I've heard from labor organizing is that this thing is going to put us out of work, and those from the other side, those whom we hate the most, the capitalists and the bosses, uh, I would say, ah, oh, this will create new forms of employment as it was with the first, the second, and the third, and blah, 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 blah. But I would also argue that within our own organization, we need to look into how we can be able to use some of these developments to our own benefit in terms of organizing, in terms of funding. Uh, there are many very practical ways in which we can be able to do uh, some of these things. I am sort of fortunate enough or unfortunate enough uh, simply because I'm a computer science student and uh, when I graduate probably I'm going to be forced to go and work for a corporate because we don't have left organization that seems to be interested on this question on, you know, computer techniques and all those kinds of things. So the changing nature of production comrades we must also engage in. Um, lastly, I wanted to say one of the challenges that is also confronting us in how do we organize some of these political sessions or schools where we're able to share knowledge? Uh, it is my frustration that most of uh, the talks that I attend, you'd find that uh, we get some academic or a student like myself, and we get working class people from communities. We get somebody to speak from the podium, and some of the people are just bored. They don't know a hell what they're talking about. And it's not just because they don't understand, but it's also the question of the language and access. So even in our own organizations, we have to find some kind of a way in which we can capacitate. If one speaks about the self-emancipation of the working class, this thing does not come post-revolution. It has to find expression within our own uh, organizations. So um, with uh, that, we, even in our own organizations, we, I'm coming from the standpoint that uh, Samora Machel once said that uh, production is a school. We learn through production. And if we can learn through production, it means we can also teach through uh, out of production. So this also means that in our own organizations, we have to prioritize more working class voices coming up so that they can be able to take some of these things into their own communities. Because most of us, most of these times, are confined into ivory towers. Um, but lastly, comrades, I'm told that I have two minutes left. Um, lastly, comrades, I would just like to leave you with this, that uh, in various organizations that we are organizing in, be it in the trade union, be it in the university campuses, be it in whatever political party that you may exist in, that wherever there is exploitation, uh, Marxist organizations should be able to offer an alternative for emancipation. Wherever there is exploitation, Marxist organizations should be able to offer alternatives for liberation. Wherever there is alienation along the lines of race or class, Marxism should be able to offer alternatives for self-emancipation, for self-organizing, for um, also self-determination. I'll leave you with that. Amanda! Amanda! Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Tabang. Uh, comrades, uh, when we started, I forgot to mention two important uh, points. One is that... Uh, we are live, we are streaming this event. And uh, two, it is that we, uh, have, we have a hashtag, Marx200. So I'd like uh, you comrades to tweet, get their tweet and retweet, like, comment, 
and let's trend, especially students, you know how this work. Let's keep that uh, uh, vibe going online on Twitter. Uh, Comrade Claire, over to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, Amandla. Pambile, Nomzo Balazo Basabenti, Pambile. Forward with the land, struggle forward. Okay, so it's, it's a bit embarrassing because I don't have very much to say that Tabang hasn't already said, but let me try and say it again differently so that we can absorb it and, and discuss it. Um, and uh, like Tabang, I started off trying to, but I w was one better than you, I tried to get it into one sentence. Uh, it's a very long sentence, but let me try. For me, Marxism is, or rather what Marxists need to try and aspire to, uh, is to develop the science and the art, because it is also an art, of how uh, the exploited cl class, which is the proletariat, the workers, and the unemployed, uh, together with the oppressed, are going to liberate ourselves. Okay, and as, as Tabang said, this is crucial. How do we, how do we uh, self-emancipate? Okay, how do we liberate ourselves through a, a collective revolution that is going to liberate the whole of humanity in liberating that one class. Okay, so Marxism, what you can see from this is that Marxism does not pretend that objectivity means giving every side an equal uh, uh, say. It does say that it takes the side of the working class, but it says that the working class, through defeating capitalism, can actually liberate everybody, uh, all, all of humanity. Um, just a, a few small preliminary remarks is that we have to remember, obviously, that Marx himself wasn't born a Marxist, okay? He developed, Marxism was something that developed through his life, and that, in fact, continues to develop long after his death, okay? And I, th I think that is a, an extremely important point, is that Marxism is, after all, it's a living, applied theory and developing theory, one that we have to keep adding to uh, in order to keep its spirit alive. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things that uh, Marxism is, as well as one or two things that it's not, um, to try and uh, uh, build a bit of a picture. Um, I think uh, Tabang's point that Marxism is a practical activity, not just a theory, is extremely important, although it is highly theoretical, but if we don't apply it, and I'm going to also try to apply it to a couple of contemporary questions, uh, then we're actually missing the heart of it. Um, and also, as, as Tabang has already said, Marxism is about recognizing that uh, class struggle drives history. But more than that, Marxism is also about how do we intervene in that class struggle to achieve the victory of, uh, of the working class, to, to encourage the victory of, of the working class over capitalism. Um, okay, so I said earlier that uh, I think of Marxism as a science, okay, and the central insight, again, it's something that Tabang's already shared with us, um, is that uh, even though when you look at the surface appearance of, of capitalism, uh, it appears that capitalism is a system based on capitalists investing money and paying workers, giving workers something, and then workers give something back, uh, what Marxism said is we have to look below the, the surface of what society looks like um, and that he discovers through that, he discovers exploitation, uh, even in uh, behind the wage form. So what appears as what uh, academics would call a, a classic worker, a free worker, although Marx is very clearly aware that actually capitalism is begun through directly coerced labor, okay? It's through slavery, it's through indentured labor, um, it's through very many forms of forced labor that capitalism is able to first establish itself to get its first wealth together uh, to start controlling the world. Uh, but even ideal uh, so-called free worker, um, who's supposedly a worker who is free to sell his or her labor power or to choose not to sell it if they prefer uh, for a wage to a capitalist. Um, and then in exchange for that, uh, they, they get the wage that they need to live on. Even this free worker is not actually free, uh, as Marx explains. Um, they're not free in the sense that they are now coerced by having to survive in a, in a situation where, as Marx says, what they're really free of is any other means 
to make a living, which makes us, when we become workers, we, uh, when, we, when we are born into the working class, um, that we have no other option except to either sell our labor power or to sit with nothing, to be unemployed and so on, or to maybe, uh, or you'll find a, a few, you know, with a, a little thing by the roadside, that you make a plan uh, to, to uh, scrape a few pennies together. And in, in that sense, uh, that is the sense that Marx says in which uh, the free worker in capitalism is actually uh, free. They're free of any other way to make a living. Okay, and so what the revolutionary insight that comes from this, firstly, is that uh, Marx points out that actually it's not true that the capitalist gives you the wage and you give them the work in, in return. What is actually happening is that the worker comes to work she does all the work, she produces all the value, and then the capitalist takes a part of what you have produced and gives it back to you in the form of a wage. Now, the, the revolutionary implication of this, there's two things that come from this. The first one is that it shows us quite clearly that under the surface of society, actually everything, all the wealth, everything built upon this earth that we see, Everything that drives or is extracted from the earth or that is turned into a useful object is the result of workers' work, not of capitalist investment. Okay? It is the working class that produces value uh, under capitalism. But that value is expropriated from us, it's taken away from us constantly uh, and turned into profit for a minority of people who sit at the top of society. But the other, so everything in this world is actually ours. And therefore, when we fight to say we want to take back the land or we want to nationalize uh, the mines and so on, we are not stealing. We are taking back what is actually rightfully belonging uh, to the working class. And the second revolutionary implication is that actually it means that in this world where we are denied power on every front, Okay, where the working class is denied economic power, we are denied political power by getting representatives that tell us one thing, then do another thing after we voted for them and so on. We are, we are denied power in our daily life at home, uh, in, 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 uh, in the workplace and so on. But the power that we retain is that capital cannot make profit unless we are doing the work for it. And therefore it gives us a weapon against capital which in its simplest form is, is a strike, where by withdrawing their labor power, workers are able to hit back at capital very directly, that workers are already, in that sense, at the heart of capital. And therefore, if we're talking about how do we occupy uh, uh, capital, how do we occupy the wealth and the workplaces and take them back, the thing is we've already got a force on the inside for doing that when workers start to develop a revolutionary consciousness and that, or revolutionary ideas, um, you know, and that force is, as I said, it's, it's the working class and the fact that they're at the center of exploitation. Okay, another central point of Marxism, um, I think, is that uh, the, the, the fact of how we organize, how humans organize themselves to produce the basics of life and within that, who exploits who? Those facts are foundational to everything else about society. Okay, it shapes everything in life. It shapes what kind of clothes we are wearing. It shapes our most personal relations, even who you have sex with and how you have sex. Those things are all finally shaped by this question of how production is organized. Now, this sounds like a very giant and ridiculous claim that actually capitalism is even coming into the bedroom with us. Um, but, and I just want to be clear that one of the things that Marxism is not, is it's not reductionist. In other words, it isn't saying, by saying this, it's not saying that everything about humans can be reduced to an economic fact. Okay, uh, Ma Marxism is very clear that we're not just economic black boxes. Okay, we're not just the machines that capital wants to make us. We don't just rock up for work or not rock up for work. We also want to be respected. We have desires. We want to succeed in life. We want to see our children grow. 
We want to fall in love. We've got all of these other things. We're agents, not robots. We want satisfaction from our lives. Okay, we've got all of these other desires. What Marxism is saying is not that these other things don't exist, but what it is saying is that uh, you, cannot, you cannot explain any part of human society without seeing it as an integrated whole. Um, so Marxism is not saying, for example, it's, it's saying that the economy is primary. It's not saying that the economy is everything. So for example, Marxism is, is saying that you can't reduce everything to class. Okay, racism, for example, is not just class dressed up in a certain skin color. Okay, racism is not a synonym for class. It's not a different word that actually means class. It's a different set of dynamics that operates within capitalism. Rape, for example, the oppression, one of the key ways that the oppression of women is enacted in the society, rape is not profitable. It's very simple, it's not profitable. You can't just say, you can explain it by the economy. But what Marx is trying to say is that you cannot divide capitalist society into different compartments that have a separate life, that over here is racism in the heads of white people, and over there is exploitation that comes out of the heads of capitalists. Okay, what Marx is saying that the whole of society um, is actually an integrated, uh, that we have to look at it as an integrated whole, as a joined up whole. Um, and so, for example, in Marx's time, he was fighting very hard against the notion that the state and politics is somehow a neutral uh, arbiter, a neutral, um, what do you call this thing in union negotiations, the, the conciliator, a neutral conciliator that stands above uh, classes in society um, and and tries to deal, get everybody on, on board together. Or the idea that we've got the version of it that we've got now, that the African National Congress is somehow able to represent workers and capitalist, uh, black capitalists at the same time. Marx rejects those ideas in favor of seeing society as an integrated whole and saying, for example, um, that you cannot understand the state only by looking at political questions. You have to understand the state as an executive arm of the capitalist class. It's the political sphere that helps to keep the economy uh, in place. Um, and similarly, for example, we have to understand how the ruling class is constantly mobilizing and maintaining different forms of oppression, such as racism, such as gender oppression, um, how, how the dominant class use those things to facilitate their never-ending pursuit of profit. Okay, so it's not that class and race are the same thing, but it is certainly the case that racism, I would argue, arises from capitalism and is then maintained and reproduced by it because it helps them to exploit people in various ways, uh, starting with the, sla the slave trade. Uh, I need to start rounding up, um, and I just want to say quickly, so, so for example, Marx saw quite clearly, and although he didn't write much about it, um, he saw very clearly that the initial stages of capitalism were built on racist justifications for forced labor, which was, which was slavery. And that in, in doing that, racism has been, as somebody put it, baked into the pie of capitalism. It's now an inherent part of capitalism that we can't really break with until we break capitalism itself. Um, uh, and later Marxists in this country, for example, by applying Marxism, were able to see and understand that in South Africa, the racist dispossession of land was not just a means of getting land, it was that, of course, uh, but that also it was the other side of creating a labor force, creating a proletariat, creating a group of people who had no other way to make a living, that they would force, be forced to go and offer themselves uh, for, for, work in, uh, for work in the mines, uh, so that the dispossession of land in this country is very centrally tied up with the dispossession of labor, with the exploitation of black labor. And similarly, by applying a, mar a holistic Marxist analysis uh, to the question of the urban land struggle, that we see that one of the things that's gonna be slowing down 
land redistribution in this country is the fact that big banks are very heavily invested in the property market. So you can maybe go and take a little patch of empty land in Potchefstroom and do a land repossession there, as comrades have successfully done, and even gotten services. But when you come here to town and you want to take Bank City, because that would be a very convenient place for people to live, suddenly there's these giant interests invest in saying, no, actually, the land cannot go back to people in this urban area. And so suddenly land redistribution starts to be thought of as a farming question and a rural question, but not as an urban question. Okay, and so to finish off, because I've gone over my time, the very last thing I want to say here um, is just that uh, what is most important, I think, about Marxism is its prescription for how to defeat capitalism. Okay, and this is where it becomes an art, not an exact science, and it's an art because that task of defeating capitalism is going to depend on literally millions of people across the world deciding to act collectively against capitalism, and therefore, it's not something that we can plan, but it is something that we, that we can prepare for, that the solution to capitalism, according to Marx, is the ultra-democracy of the mass of the people, of the proletariat, of the biggest class actually starting to take power into their own hands and reorganizing production according to how we want to run it. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Claire and uh, Comrade uh, Tabang. Marxism is a science. Comrade Claire is saying Marxism is art, not just science, it's art. Uh, so, uh, Comrade Tavang, Comrade Clay, this is how we are going to conduct this uh, engagement. You are going to raise your hand and introduce yourself and your political affiliation, and then you either comment or you ask a question. We're going to take uh, five uh, uh, questions per... We're going to take five questions, and then the speak we'll, I'll bring the speakers in, and then just like that, until we exhaust the conversation. So, the, the floor is open. So the floor is open. There are two roving mics on both sides. Questions are welcome. Comments are also welcome. Okay, this is number one. Do you have uh, number two? Come right here. And then number three. We have three for now. Going, oh, number four. Last one. Number five, comrades, uh, uh, keep your numbers. This is number one, and comrades here is number two, number three, number four, and number five here. Yes, in that order. Mandla. Wait, two. Mandla. Forward, with socialism forward. forward. Uh, I think I will share some few, uh, whether you say it's a discussion or I would like to say that uh, it is correct by complete clear that uh, you can't redistribute land without nationalizing because there's going to be a contradiction there. Because if you want to take the buildings, the buildings which are owned by banks, which is monopoly capital, you will have a problem there where interest rates will rise and you'll find that there are many, you are creating the same people that uh, you say that you are giving land back to. You are directly putting them back into debt. And then they will have no other option but to resell that land that you said you are fighting for them to have. <clears throat> so when you re redistribute land, you must redistribute with nationalizing. That is why the ANC now, after ad uh, adopting the land distribution, it does no longer now want to, 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 to implement that <coughs> because there is a problem there. And with Comrade Tabang, uh, I fully agree. <coughs> I don't think the working class is against the fourth industrial revolution. But the only demand for the working class is that we must be the owners 
remember that after having the fourth industrial revolution, the profits, who will benefit out of that? Uh, uh, sorry, comrade, to interject there. Can you please wrap up? You've been okay. on the floor for a, a long time. Okay, sorry. <coughs> so, we do want the youth to continue to study and have an improved technology. But whilst doing that, we must be the owners in terms of that. So, <coughs> because of time, uh, usually in NUMSA you are given time, but uh, it's too little now. But I'll just com uh, comment on those for now. Thank you. Th th thank you, Comrade. Uh, comrade over here. Yeah. Uh, comrade, the uh, nationalization of land in one layer is a legislative process, which is important but we need a people's power process, and that's what the comrades in the South are trying to do by occupying. But essentially, you pointed out to the contradiction is that, in fact, at some point, we've got to, by mass struggle, take over and run the society by the ordinary people on the ground. They will have to then decide this problem. We can't be, oh, well, the interest rates can arise. Oh, no, we're not going to do a land struggle today, because tomorrow it's going to arise. So, uh, all right. Now, but I wanted to come to the point is that Marx also looks at uh, capitalism as a system of crisis. The tendency of the rate of profit to fall creates crisis in society. Not necessarily us on the soapbox fighting for, for socialism. We create a crisis for them by struggling against the fact that they plunge us into continual crisis and booms and bumps, uh, booms and slumps. So it's always going to happen. It's a crisis, miserable, messed up life we live in, in this whole world. And we have to fight through it by mass action. Now, we talk about uniting the working class. You can only unite the working class internationally and locally on the five anti-principles. That is anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, anti-xenophobia, and anti-imperialism. That is the basis. If you move off any of those points, you cannot achieve unity. All right. Also, Marxism is an extreme democracy. It's not shallow democracy. It's not one person, one vote. It is daily democracy. That's why it takes up the slogans of the Paris Commune, the right of immediate right of recall. Super should have gone yesterday if we're in a social society. That's it. You're gone. All right, not like, oh, Ramaphosa, I'm a bit worried about shaking the boat now, or there's a cabal around them. Sorry, the people in that area showed they didn't want him, should be uh, gone. Right of recall, not living in luxury houses, average rate, this is extreme democracy. But to achieve this, revolution is required. Not negotiation, not the Kudessa scenario to South Africa that we land now 20 odd years later, still bickering, still oppressed, still fighting over land, still fighting over wages, our strike. Uh, rules that we won is getting rolled back in the latest labor legislation yes, and we are getting eight. presented with a miserable a minimum wage of 20 rand and domestic work, uh, what's it, 11? Come Something, do, I don't know, you know what I mean? It just Come on the floor. Madness. All right, uh, thank you, comrade. But it does require revolution. Uh, I would like, uh, uh, number three, I'd like to appeal to uh, comrades to just stick to two minutes. Uh, Please, uh, over to you, Comrade. Okay, Amanja. Amanja. Matimba. Sure. Um, okay, so now. So, so, sorry, can you please uh, keep a distance? Oh, okay, so that sure. It, yes. uh, can I be heard? All right, sharp. Uh, I think um, there's a scenario, you know, with regards to the fourth industrial revolution, um, where even labor itself will become irrelevant in a sense where it's being replaced by machines and even petty bourgeois. Uh, professions, you know, like lawyers and even accountants are even under threat, for an example, and where a majority of even the working class will form part of the reserve labor. So in such a circumstance, where does a socialist revolution, where do socialist movements see themselves in a development of capitalism? Because the power of capitalism is in its ability to always reinvent itself, but then its contradictions still remain the same. And on the issue, I, I, I like a point that was raised by Comrade Tabang over there in the front when he mentioned the issue that race can never be separated from the worker struggle. Because at the end of the day, 
white workers have always maintained, on, uh, have always protected their own whiteness. I mean, a scenario of this is the 1922 Rennes Revolt, where white workers were shot down by the government of Jan Smarts. But then if you look at the main ball of contestation and the reason why they were striking was that they could be treated better than black minor And the outcome of that was that they were separated and given and incentivized even more for their labor as compared to black workers. So in that sense, I think we cannot necessarily separate the race struggle from the class struggle. And as a matter of fact, before we actually contest towards a class struggle, we must first solve the race issue first. Because as black people, that's the main contradiction in South Africa, race struggle. Because you're not hated because you're proletariat, you're not hated because you're petty bourgeois black or whatever, but you're hated just merely on the fact of your blackness. And even white workers in the workplace, today, they are still incentivized even more than black workers. So those are my points. Oh yeah, and another issue is that on the issue of uh, 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 trade unions, um, okay, we've seen that NUMSA is challenging the issue of uh, 20 rand a day, which is an insult to the working class. But then any uh, wage increase still results towards the exploitation of workers of the day, because wage increases and inflation and all of the tools of capitalism, they don't go hand in hand because as soon as you raise uh, is VAT increases and inflation increases, and on top of that, the, the, the worker still remains poor, the worker still remains uh, alienated as well. So I, I want us to also think about, you know, the role of trade unions and, 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 and uh, their role in a socialist revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, number four. It's over there. Over there, can you can you please get a mic? And please, I've noticed that comrades are not introducing themselves. <laughs> can <laughs> Amanda? <laughs> Amanda. Isoletu. Yeah, yeah, Africa. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tami Wukwe. I'm from Freedom Park. Uh, mine will just be two questions. The first question is, how is capitalism? being maintained in South Africa after 1994. The second one is, who are the motive forces in South Africa for the socialist revolution? Thank you. Uh, that is quick and thank you, comrade. Number five. Amanda. Comrade. This sugar and chona colony. A cab. A gucutula or guamamba. This sugar pagumbo to a socialist revolutionary workers' party. As a law in umsa. The whistering committee gave a handing on to challenge the whistering committee. Say province. Eh, Zungo Kelly, Niza on Toler and Niza Tetangale, Gelluimi, the Tumba, the comfortable wool. Now on Toler. Eh, O Karl Marx law, seated on I. We are that go away in Mund, Nyan. Good and going a gabico on Gomye um to Oka Velengendo, a put to go go greater, like that. Ukat Iluba, Quatina, Asikat Ingi, Goguanel, Okanya Sitalwe, San and Lesana, a mean yok ing, Ugo Kritwala Trako. Ogres bean Ingaba in Donina Tina, see late generation, see you. As it in Bapam Goba Sife, Sizaubesi Achiville, Ingaba Gugazisa Abandu. Ngale Marxism. Okanye. Si ngame lukwazi sabandu bati benge kayazi. Sifu nukienza. Kotwa ikona indofunega. Si vele si fokase kuyotina. Si zitale liba. Isi zuguluana so kususela ngo 2000. Uke uma ngo 2050. Saat inisegi suba. E Afrika na kuitabati. Si abazisa abandu. Ngo butule no utinga. Boba. Si ngafikele lanjani na. Kwi socialism. Diboza kwa zinko kele zipambu wetuwa. Zitengu batina zile generation. 
What is it that we can achieve as a generation and be proud of? Thank you very much. Uh, thank, th thank you, comrade. Thank you, comrade. Uh, just a quick word. Uh, everyone, comrades, is allowed to express themselves in their home language, in the language that they are comfortable in. And we'll just like to ask uh, any Kosa speaker here who would be willing to translate what uh, the comrade over there was saying. Us to leave. All right, uh, thanks, comrade. Uh, I think what my comrade was saying is that um, Karl Marx, it is clear that Karl Marx is one of the most um, intellectuals that was produced. Because since after Karl Marx, there has not been any uh, that has reached his level in terms of thinking. Uh, but he also asked uh, the, the, the the mission, what is the mission of Marxist? Is it only to raise the levels of consciousness or is it also to raise the consciousness, the levels of consciousness so that we bring about changes in our society? And um, he also talked about the contribution of the current generations from 2000 till now in terms of, um, uh, is it technological advancement? I think that's what the comrade was saying. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I've heard him say. Uh, th th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope we are still uh, tweeting comrades and retweeting. Remember, the hashtag is uh, Max200. Let's continue to follow and, uh, and so that we can trend. Uh, I've engaged with uh, both of uh, my comrades over here, and uh, they agree that we should take uh, three more hands. Uh, so that when they come, it, they will address everything. So I'll take uh, three more hands. I see a hand there is number one. I see number two. I see the third one here. Okay, let's keep it at that for now. Number one there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Archie. Uh, and I'm a left activist uh, from the Free State. Uh, I think... Uh, my understanding gives me that uh, it's been a very long time that people have been confused because I hear comrades talking when they talk. They talk about race and they talk about black and white. But if we all understand the uh, ideas of Marxism, we would have obviously come across the fact that there is only one human race. There is not a black race and a white race and a green race and a purple race. I think we are all human. And this populist uh, phrases that have been used to separate us as uh, human beings and uh, referring to us as black and white and this and that color is exactly what has been used by some people to popularize and to make themselves popular uh, amongst uh, the masses to advance whatever program they're interested in. My question comes here. I'd like to ask one question. Uh, is that how do we use the ideas of Marxism today with all this confusion around people to be able to explain to the layman in the street that with these ideas, this is how you are going to be liberated? How do we do that? Because it is not everybody that can read and understand the ideas of Marxism. How do we take this to the, the ordinary man in the street? Because it is very easy for anybody today to call themselves a Marxist and so on. But uh, they are only then using those ideas sometimes to popularize themselves and using the ideas of Marxism uh, in this popularity to advance programs of their own interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, number two, it's over there. Okay, uh, hi to all the comrades. Um, I'm Lisa Honolo from uh, Freedom Park. Um, I think there's been a, 
uh, questions around uh, what other people perceive as limitations of Marxism in terms of dealing with uh, the race issue or, or, or patriarchy. So I think what I would like to ask is that uh, sh sh shouldn't we come up with a theoretical framework that consists of all of these of, of the theoretic uh, frameworks which speak to these issues of, of race, of patriarchy, in order to address all the antagonisms. So that's what, that, that was my question. And I'd also like to a little bit disagree with uh, 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 the comrade that, that just spoke now about all of us belonging to, yes, we do belong in, into, in, in the human race, but we must not forget, I think the, also the, 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 the biggest gain that came from the white world uh, oppressing, for instance, Africans, also came in the form of symbolic murder, our reduction to the subhuman level. So we cannot assume a common humanity with white people in any way before justice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, comrade. Uh, number Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, comrade. Uh, can we please have one last question, preferably from a lady? I'll just take a lady from this one. Here. Yeah. Oh, a woman, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hello. Sanwanan, hi, guys. Um, my name is Mbali, and I am from the EFF Student Command, so it's a campus, UJ. So I have a question uh, regarding Marxism, right? We say that the way we can liberate the proletariat, who is the worker, is through overthrowing uh, the, the, the capitalist, the bourgeoisie, right? How are we going to do that? We always say a revolution, a revolution, but we don't state the actual steps. Fine, the first step is awareness, consciousness, then what's after that? So that is my question, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now it's over to our speakers. I'll over to uh, Comrade Tabang. Okay. okay, sure. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not going to try and answer all the things. Uh, but just to try and deal quickly with uh, Zwalaki's two questions, and this one about um, uh, co uh, the first step being consciousness and then what. Um, okay, so uh, quickly on the, the question about the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution. I have questions, not answers. But the, the questions I want to ask myself is, is if we're talking about replacing workers with machines, it, it is a thing that Marx tries to understand, is what happens when you start trying to mechanize. Okay, and what, what he understands, first of all, is that the value um, that is extracted from the work of the machine is only the value that went into it in the first place from some worker making a machine that could make things, right? So that's the technical way that he tries to answer that question. But if you, if you try and think about it in real terms, okay, first, it's very obvious why capital would love to replace us all with machines, because the problem with humans is that we are, uh, we are a thinking tool, okay? And the, the problem with that is we're a tool that has our own desires and wishes, and that therefore is always resisting exploitation and resisting power in the workplace and so on. Okay, but it's, it's also because we're a thinking tool that we are useful to capital, 
Okay, well, why, why they bother with workers at all is because we can think for ourselves. And therefore, capitalists are able to just say, okay, your job is X, Y, and Z, and this is the money you get for doing this many hours, and then they let you do it. They don't have to, like, uh, the supervision that happens on the factory floor and in the workplace, it isn't supervision about how to do the job. It's supervision to keep you on the job, that's all, to make you keep to time and that kind of thing. But it's because uh, uh, we're, we're a thinking tool that capital needs us at all. So, so the question I ask about replacing us with machines um, is firstly, who's going to make and maintain these machines? So even though the working class might be shrinking, surely there will still be a group of people who are essential uh, to keep the thing going. Now maybe there is a point that we cross when the number of people in work is too small to make a difference. Okay, but as long as there are some workers doing the work who are still somehow tied up to the people who are excluded, which is still the case now, then there is a chance for that majority to, to actually overthrow capitalism. And you know, also, also in terms of, um, you know, the only, uh, surely to replace us completely, uh, they would have to make machines that can fix the machines and produce the machines and conceptualize the next machine. And at that point, we've got artificial intelligence, but then I'm asking, why is artificial intelligence going to go on working for some stupid humans who say we're capitalists and we own everything? So I, I don't know, those are sort of the questions I ask. Um, I think the, the, uh, a more urgent question for us right now is the question about how to deal with uh, the, the questions of racism and um, how, how we deal with the question of white workers, for example. Okay, and, and how, how can Marxism actually grasp what racism is about? Um, so I think the first point that I want to make there is that I think we have to make a distinction between white workers in South Africa, that's one set of uh, uh, things that we have to face, and when we look at the global situation uh, where white workers make up, I'm trying to remember, uh, Alan told me this figure, I think he was saying that white workers make up about 20% of the world's workforce, black workers 20%, and everything else in between is maybe Indian and Chinese, you can correct me. Uh, okay, but obviously globally, I think the white working class, the question of the white working class is much more important in a place like the USA or uh, very many parts of Europe where actually the majority of the working class is white. Whereas in, in South Africa, the majority of the working class is black and that means that the white working class is not such an important question. Okay, but um, if we think about how racism works, so, so what Trilaki was pointing to, it's exactly true that that is one of the ways that racism helps to facilitate exploitation, is by giving white workers an illusion, okay, and I think it is an illusion, um, uh, the, the illusion that somehow being white can compensate for being exploited or that it's enough to give you enough self-esteem to live within capitalism and to put up with it. Uh, du Bois actually talks about this, he calls it a psychic wage. Okay, but what's important about this is he points out that the psychic wage uh, doesn't just add to the real wage that you get, it compensates for the real wage. Okay, so whereas in South Africa, yes, because white workers are a tiny minority, it was possible to incentivize them more, as you put it, by actually giving them more. In these other countries, what is going on is that the psychic wage keeps the white worker quiet and keeps the wage down. Okay, and this was actually proved empirically that uh, two different people did research in the USA where they found that in areas where racism is higher, which they measured by saying the wage, how big is the wage gap between black and white workers? They found that in the areas where the wage gap was bigger, that also in those areas, the wages that white workers were getting were lower than the average. Okay, so in other words, racism was not just pulling down the black workers' wage dramatically, but it was also a way of holding down the white workers' wage. Okay, so uh, white workers, I think, in this regard, are in a contradictory position. It's not a simple question of saying that they're bought by the system or they're not. By being white, you do get advantages from, from, uh, compared to black workers in the system, but also when you accept the racism in the system, what starts to happen is you also are aiding the cap, uh, you're, you're going with the capitalist flow. That's a way of keeping wages down by saying, okay, if you don't like what you're getting, off you go, Joe, we'll replace you with Sipo. 
And the same thing happens with, by the way, with women's and men's wages. It's also, again, an empirically proven relation that through, you know, even though rape is not profitable, but the idea that women exist to serve men is profitable in the sense that it allows capitalists to say, it's not our business once you leave the workplace, it's not our business how you clean your house and cook your food. Find yourself a woman to do it. And if you're a woman, well, you've just got to like do a double shift. Okay, so, so I think these are ways um, that actually uh, we understand that racism is not just about the ideas in white people's heads. That's, that's a reflection of a structure of society, okay, that supports the, the racist ideas that white people have. That insulates, for example, white people in this country are physically insulated by their relative wealth from the conditions of the majority of people in this country. So when, when Penny Sparrow goes around going, oh my God, we're being flooded, she actually has no idea what, she literally has no idea what people in the rest of the country went through. She, she doesn't see it. She lives in a little bubble of uh, insulated by, by structural racism. Sorry, I have to stop there. I'm sorry. Um, I don't think I need to go on for too long just to, to spoil that. But I'm just going to touch on three things. Um, uh, Comrade, I think you are correct to say when you were relating this thing, um, the Rand Rebellion in 1922, I think. And um, I want to agree with you that even though that race, race is uh, it's not based on any biology whatsoever, but it exists within us uh, in society, it plays itself uh, institutionally in our relationships in many different forms. But one of the, the lessons that I wanted to, to draw from, uh, from that strike, um, it's the question of having to recognize and observe that capital will stop at nothing to advance its own interests. When the white working class went on a strike, the unsmarts dropped some bombs on there, and a few hundreds of things they were died, and about like thousands and thousands of them were wounded. And even this today, this also reminds us of Americana of then. So I think in, in that sense, we have to also understand the capital. It's insidious, it will use anything it's in its own way to achieve its own, uh, its own gains. Um, the question of what can be achieved uh, was raised by Comrade Sondela from the Western Cape uh, Provincial Steering Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party. <laughs> um, I think maybe what can be achieved, I think that it, first and foremost, there needs to be some kind of a collective target. And I think when we talk about uh, having to get rid of exploitation, we don't talk about some kind of exploitation. For an example, in the Workers' Party, there's a talks about nationalization and the working, work, uh, workers' control. So that in itself is a target that people have to advance and champion and then take it forward. And that in itself, it has to become a generational mission that it has to be achieved in that political organization. Um, then the question of like the youth education, yes, I do agree we have to get our own degrees, we have to be educated and all this. One of the things that we also have to realize is that also capitalism creates this thing of like manual and intellectual labor. And I don't think even in our own organizations we need to exaggerate that. We have to imagine a world where, as I was saying earlier on, like the knowledge that is accumulated when workers are in the point of production in their homes can be able to be theorized so that they can be able to share it with other parts of the world and other sections of the, of the working class. Because I don't think we need to be exaggerating this thing that this division of labor that, oh, you and so-and-so, you are just an intellectual thinker, and one is just a manual, it's just an object where uh, labor is just is extracted from as if they don't have the reasoning capacity, as if they can't ask complex questions. But it's about us having ourselves, when one speaks about decolonization amongst the universities and amongst ourselves as students, it goes to ex exactly that, amongst ourselves as students, before we talk about, hey, let's decolonize society, let's decolonize ourselves to be able to see the working class differently. Um, I think I just, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say that. Thank you very much for all the comments. I think they were very incisive. Uh, comrade from Nimsa raised the very thing about like this fourth industrial revolution, who is it going to benefit? I think uh, that's a very, very critical, critical question. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, comrades. Uh, comrades, can we please give our speakers a, a round of applause? <laughs> and uh, it's a, it's a wrap up, this is where we end. I'd like to thank you for uh, cooperating with us.
and we are going for a short break. We're going to come back at 11.30. And to our viewers at home, uh, comrades who are watching from all around the country, uh, we'll be back at exactly 11.30. Thank you very much, comrades.